a storm beckoned the state of Arizona, signaling the Canon West drivers were ready for an intense doubleheader. And it didn't disappoint once again, as there was a lot of tight action, tempers flurry, title aspirations changing, and one man who conquered Tucson Speedway that shook up the championship trail. Without further ado, let's get it on with the latest episode of West Coast Wednesday. And it starts right now. Alrighty, the latest episode of West Coast Wednesday, where I'll be discussing not one, but both Port of Tucson Twin 100 races that took place on Saturday, May 11th. We got so much to discuss about, so many highlights, so many debriefs. Let's get going with the highlights. Lightning and rain pushed the first Port of Tucson 100 from 7 p.m. to past 9 p.m. as Irwindale runner-up finisher and KNN East regular Tanner Gray won the pole. But it was NFL not for long as his time at the front lasted just one quarter as Derek Krause took control of the race, looking to make his claim as the best of the regionals. The action was anything but tame as Krause couldn't pull away from the leaders throughout the race. Meanwhile, points leader Haley Deegan made her case know that she's looking for a turnaround, battling with fellow female and teammate Brittany Zamora, who had a tremendous run in the first race. She finished fifth. Krause kept leading as he simply couldn't get away from Gray and Jagger Jones even with lap traffic playing a role. The trio were running blistering laps until the first caution came out on lap 40 when Bobby Hillis Jr. went up into the wall in turn 2 but was able to get his car going without serious harm. On the restart, Jagger Jones found an opening but he was slightly cut off by Krause and couldn't have thrown him out of the front spot as he led every single lap to that point. Further back, Arizona native Matt Levine faced pressure from Sabora as he had his strongest run of the season, keeping his nose clean and remained consistent all night. The series' first major accident of the season took place on the 69th lap involving Travis Milburn's number 08 Cart Idaho Chevrolet. Tough break for him after scoring a 7th in the first race at South Boston last Saturday. After getting out of his car, Tempers flared as Milburn made it clear to Todd Sousa, Thou shalt not mess with an Idahoan, you fool! Milburn finished a dismal 16th, while Sousa settled for 8th. Another restart gave Gray another shot at Cross, but again, another solid exit in the corners got the number 16 Napa Toyota in front yet again. And from there, he was finally able to distance himself away from the field. It seems like a recurring theme now. Jones versus Deegan. Deegan versus Jones. As they were battling for third in the closing lap. As Cross finally sealed the deal in a race he completely dominated on the West Coast, he crossed the line for his first Canada West win of 2019. Meanwhile, Deegan got by Jones for third entering turn two, which could be pitiable in her quest for the title later on. However, with Krause's sixth career k and West win, it put him on top of the championship standings over Deegan by four points. As soon as the race concluded, torrential downpour back in Tucson once again. But that didn't matter to Krause as he got himself a victory. Hey, Derek Krause, looks like rain your lucky deal, man. You won last Sunday at Boston Speed. We got rain here tonight. Another 100 laps. What do you think? Uh, yeah, we came to Tucson thinking and there's no way it's going to rain out here in the desert, but I proved us wrong here tonight. But... Overall, pretty good night so far. We got 100, another 100 laps here to get in once this rain stops. So I'm really looking forward to the second 100. Here are the results of the first Port of Tucson 100. Derek Krause claimed the victory. Tanner Gray finished second. Haley Deegan takes third. Jagger Jones finished fourth. Brittany Samora fifth. Matt Levine, Trevor Huddleston, Todd Sousa, Dustin Ash, and John Wood run out the top 10. A tremendous result for John Woods' number 38 car. In the bottom half, it was Cody Vanderwall who swept both races a year ago. He was non-factor at all in the first race. Ron Jay takes a respectable 12th. Bobby Hillis Jr. 13th. Austin Thom in 14th. Takuma Koga 15th. And then in the bottom three who didn't finish the race were Travis Milburn, Bill Can, and Billy Ken who did not participate in the first race as he withdrew before the green flag dropped. There was a grand total of two cautions for 15 laps, and the margin of victory was 4.433 seconds. Derek Krauss led every single lap, wire to wire. And at that point, here's the championship standings. Derek Krauss had a four-point lead over Deegan. A further four more markers back was Jagger Jones. For Trevor Huddleston, Matt Levine cracks it on top five in the K&N West standings. Brittany Zamora and Todd Zuza ends up in a tie for sixth. Cody Vanderwall moves up two spots in the championship standings in eighth. Travis Milburn in ninth, and Tanner Gray 
crack the top 10 with a runner-up finish. With that being said, here is the second race highlights. Yet again, once the track was dry, more K&N West action was about to commence as soon as the green flag dropped, right? Think again. Todd Souza's number 13 Central Coast Cabinets Toyota didn't fire up and failed to take the start, credited with a 16th place result. That meant no payback from Milburn, who drove his traditional Idaho 208 car in this race. Down in front, due to having the fastest lap in race number one, Kennewick Washington's Brittany Samora took pole honors for the first time in her career and led the first 19 laps. But again, business was about to pick up in just a matter of no time as the battle for second heated up. Starting with last year's Tucson doubleheader winner Cody Vanderwall, who was a complete apathon in the first race, battling with Derek Krause. Vanderwall held off Cross, but he had seven hungry Wolverines behind his tail who were wanting to take second from him. Krause, Matt Levine, Deegan, the Sunrise four cars of Jones and Huddleston, Gray, and Dustin Ash. Double the three wide. Didn't matter. Tremendous action all around, and it lasted for several laps. Meanwhile, Samora was like, See you later, I'm out of here. As to who won the battle, it was Tucson native of Levine and Ash who took second and third and set their eyes on Zamora. Then on the 19th lap to do a cut, Zamora with Ash going high to take the race lead. For Ash, this was his first KNN race weekend since his only start prior to Saturday at Tucson, no less in 2015. He finished third in a Jeff Jefferson entry, finishing behind his then teammate Grayson Ross and current Xfinity Series driver Noah Gregson. Krause, who was eyeing on the sweep, remained quiet in the first half but stayed in the top five, hoping for a caution to get him back into the swing of things. Well, he didn't need it as he and Zamora caught Ash with the post hitter peaking low and regained the lead back on lap number 54 as Ash intervened and would also lose second to Krause. Not that long after the caution came out for issues from Levine's number 10 Florida two-star Chevrolet, who was having a strong top five run to that point. Levine fell out of contention for the win and settled for fifth. Samora led the field off to the restart, but in what would be a theme for the rest of the night, restarts, restarts, restarts plagued her performance as Gray nudged her from behind. And Cross took the race lead for the first time in the second race, pulling away with these as the field bunched up once again. And hello, Deegan, moving up the third, making it a Bill McAnally 1 2 3 run. Someone had to give, and it proved to be Ash, who made contact with Gray and to turn three, resulting in a spin that almost collected Jones, who went in a complete stop to avoid him. Bobby Hillis Jr. also went around, but near the three cars had significant damage and kept on rolling. On the restart, Cross yet again with a great jump. Zamora did not. As for her teammate Deegan, she had yet another egregious outcome. As Trevor Huddleston turned her around in turn one, this resulted in a flat left front tire. Then her right side of her number 19 Monster Energy Toyota began dragging, and with that, her string of bad luck continues since her win at the dirt circuit in Las Vegas over two months ago. Deegan finished in 15th, five laps down, and lost three spots in a championship trail in a span of two races in one single night. The final caution came out for Vanderwall, and it's sick to say it was a nightmare being back on the track he swept both races a year ago. He ended up 12th and just hopes luck is on his side next month in Colorado. Cross proved to be too much with the rest of the competition on the final restart and got out the broom because he swept both Port of Tucson 100 races. It's Cross's 8th career Canon West win and his 4th regional victory of 2019 including his wins at New Smyrna in the second South Boston race. Cross led the last 39 laps and will head into Colorado with an 18 point lead over the Sunrise 4 duo of Huddleston and Jones. More importantly, as the undisputed K&M Pro Series Championship leader as he also leads the East standings by 4 points over Sam Mayer. Once again, Tanner Gray takes second in K&N West competition. It simply stated that he didn't have much of a run to catch cross, as the certain place man in the K&N East stands will have to wait another race to get a crack on the race winner. I was trying to race him hard, but uh, we just didn't have what it took to, to get it done tonight. He, uh, he was really fast and drove a really good race, so um, you know, congratulations to him. And uh, you know, I can't thank everybody enough uh, for, for staying out after the rain and everybody from DJR Crosley for, for bringing fast race cars to the racetrack. It was uh, a lot of fun there. It got pretty hectic there for a while, but 
um, it ended up good. So, thank you. Footwork time had proved to be costly for the young Zamora, who scored a career-high third after leading her first laps in her NASCAR k and Pro Series career. It's just a little bit of footwork that I need to work on here. Uh, this is still my first season in these cars, third race in the West Series, and so, you know, I'm still learning, got a long ways to go, but, I mean, hey, third place is a good start. Hey, I think she did good. She got the rookie and uh, got a little bit of yellow off of tonight. She finished third place. A huge thank you to BMR. To Enios Motor Oil, there I know a lot of um, those guys are here tonight. Napa, the Davis Group, uh, my entire crew. We worked so hard all weekend, and huge props to them. Here are the final results of the second Porta Tucson 100. Cross claimed yet another victory. Tanner Gray missed the runner-up of the West Coast, takes second. Brandon Zamora takes third. Trevor Huddleston takes a fourth-place run that puts him in a good position of perhaps being the ultimate dark horse contender and most improved driver of 2019. Jagger Jones takes a respectable six after just missing the wreck by inches. Dustin Ash, on the other hand, ended up in seventh. Travis Milburn finished eighth. Takuma Koga with his first top ten of the season. An impressive run for him. Takes ninth. Also, Bill Can with a tremendous result. He'll finish 10th. Dustin Thomas 11th. Cody Vanderwall 12th. Ron J 13th. Bobby Hillis 14th. Deegan and sub 15th. Todd Sousa 16th. John Wood was 17th. He also did not partake in the start despite finishing 10th in the first race. And there were four cautions for 20 laps. The margin of victory this time was 2.612 seconds. With the madness now over, here is the championship standings after four. 14 races completed with the next race being in Colorado on June 8th. Crass leads Huddleston and Jones by 18 points. Haley Deegan is now 23 markers behind. Now fourth in the championship trail. Brittany Samora moves up to fifth in the standings, 29 behind. Matt Levine is 31 markers behind the six. Todd Sousa seven. A tie for eight between Travis Milburn and Cody Vanderwall and rounding at the top 10 with 52 points behind Tanner Gray. And with that, that's both Tucson races for you. There's really not much to honestly say. It's pretty straightforward. Let's talk about race number one first. I will say definitely Samora and Deegan had a pretty nice battle. Of course, they have their little history going back to the K&N East race at Bristol, which it saw Deegan's day ultimately end later on after a little bit of damage and so on, and but mostly car reliability problems that knocked her out of the running. And I saw some comments that they were not too fond of Samora's driving, more or less because she was, in their eyes, of the people I saw in the comments say, she was in the way of Deacon, who was actually quicker. And as teammates, it's, just, it's like, one thing, this is not Formula One. There's no team orders. It's mostly, as long as you keep your, as long as you stay out of trouble, you'll be okay. And we have not seen teammates get into it each other to cause huge ramifications so far. Who's to say that won't happen this season? It could happen. You never know. Remember, as I mentioned in the past, Deegan is an unremorseful competitor. She'll put the bumper on whoever it might be, whether it's a Ford or a Toyota. It doesn't matter who it is. She'll put the bumper. But it was all in all a pretty clean battle. The whole race in that first stint was really clean for the absolute most part, except for Milburn and Souza. And it's one of those things where you have to see the NBCS and Talakas if they make note of it, if they show it. But with Milburn flipping Souza off, I don't know if they'll air that. It's one of those things. If you caught it live, good for you. Fortunately, that whole race is also up on YouTube. They usually are. So it's all mighty and dandy. But... It sucks for Milburn, in my opinion, because, like I mentioned, he finished seventh in the K9 East race. He was the best of the West of those regulars, and to have a beautiful race, so that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful paint scheme, I might add. For that to happen to him, it's just frustrating. Then with Sousa taking him out, this isn't the first time Sousa caused a little bit of a stir, whether he did it or someone else taking Sousa out of the running. I remind myself of Evergreen, where Sousa's crew were extremely livid be riddling and shooing the living hell out of Takuma Koga. And which, by the way, I'll mention in the second race notes, that Koga got a top 10. A tremendous run comparing the first one where he was laps down and not factor. Speaking of lap traffic, for once, lap traffic was not a major hindrance of the competition as it was the first two races. You had a lane to go. You can pretty much go any lane, top, middle, or, or in the bottom. Now, as you saw in those battles and some of those clips, 
They were competing. They were giving it all out. Sure, there was only one incident that it kind of went haywire, but the re- other than that, it was clean, hard-fought racing, regional style. And no doubt, they delivered the bill. Because when you look at the other racing series, excluding Formula 1, because let's face it, those who watch, Smash Grand Prix was get a pillow and good night. That's what it was. And it was not a Ferrari choke vest. It was Mercedes just outright dominated completely, 100%. No sandbag required. IndyCar was delivered. The Cup Series delivered for once. Well, not really for once, but when it comes to other sanctionings, they were on par. Truck Series delivered. K&N races delivered as well. Sure, it was not going to top Irwin Day with that epic finish, that last lap battle between Tanner Gray and Trevor Huddleston. There's no way. That's going to be a tough one to beat this season. But this was the first year race where just one car dominated and actually sealed the deal. That's what Derek Krause did. And those lap traffic did not get in the way. They actually mind their own business, including Ron Jay. Whereas in South Boston, that wasn't the case. And he ran that South Boston race too. But Ron Jay kept, kept him out of trouble. Didn't got anybody's way, neither did Takuma Koga. Bruce Hillis, to a degree, minded his own business. So all was mining and dandy for once in the lap traffic. And oh, the production for once. I have no complaints about the production. The only minor complaint is why did they cut off in the second Victory Lane interview, which I'll mention, was, I might as well mention right now that Cross won. They cut, off, they cut off. That's why you only saw the first race inter- quotes and in interview audio from Krauss because that's the only one that they aired. The second one it was only Gray and Samara. Which honestly if there were if I were to give three stars of the game, I would give it to those three, Kraus, Samara, and Tanner Gray. And Gray had a quiet race. Let's just say he had a pretty quiet race to finish second. He's like he was there. He wasn't all that flashy, but he was there. Competitive. I will love to see him run more West races. I like to see him give it a go at Sonoma. And maybe the finale of Phoenix, for sure. I like to see how he'll parade in that championship battle, if it is indeed tight. Right now, with the double-digit point lead that Cross has after four races, who knows? But remember, it's the K&N West. Anything can happen. You can have one really good race, but then when one end, you have one incident, and that will knock you out of a couple, 10, 15 points. You just don't know with this series. And that is a true fact. Speaking of, before we actually do talk about the second race, Cody Vanderwall, I mentioned he was not factor the first. He was not factor in, at either of the races, except for that little bit in race number two. He's just, he was just not there. He's just, he was outnumbered, even with a competitive car, a more competitive car in my, I remember he won in, in, it was a Flying Dutchman car a year ago. This year it was a Levine entry. But a Levine car did impressive, and it's the hometown native Matt Levine, as I mentioned in the first race point standing. After the points, after the first race, he was fifth in points. Now he'll head to Colorado six in points. I say he's one of those guys that he's getting there. I think over time. Well, the team has a win. Sheldon Creed won the first Vegas dirt race ever. By the way, I feel like. If ever if something happens to both Sunrise Fords and Bill McAnally cars, which I doubt it'll happen, but you never know, Levine could be in that spot. And I think, and I at this moment of this season, I can see, I can I honestly honestly see Levine getting a top three. And if all if it's a wacky race, a wacky night, maybe he'll get a win. You just don't know. He's been doing it for a while. I know he's been heavily involved, and based on the FanChoice.tv stream. Levine, the Levine family played a huge role to get Phoenix, well, ISM Raceway is now known as, back in the K&N West schedule. So he's been not just involved in the, owning the team, having multiple entries, running really well too. He's been doing a lot, and I and I condone him for it. And I think over time, if he keeps going and going, he had a, he had a really good run in Vegas in the third race. I might add, he had a really good run. And what I saw, that was like, Oh, look at Matt Levine doing pretty well. Pretty pretty stout and, and, and all that. It's good to see a guy like him doing well. Sure, he's not in the top five after four races, but just for him to be in the top five for one race, even if it was like about an hour and a half, it shows that they're making progress. And I know I said Trevor Huddleston is in the running for most improved. I say he Matt Levine is not that far off. He's not. 
Now we move on to the second race. And boy, that battle for second, where there were like eight cars going for it. And at a short track like Tucson, the home, pretty much the original circuit of the Gander Outdoors track series. Remember the Winter Heat Series, the ferry, they, that was the mecca of the Winter Heat Series, Tucson Speedway. To see cars like that competitive in a short track and, and somehow survive in that exchange. I thought they were going to wreck at some point, but they used their heads really well. Nobody really wrecked at all. Sure, in the, in the, on one of the race stars, Dustin Ash, who I might say, superb run. So he made that seven car look really good. And the irony of it all, coincidentally, for the second straight, for the second time, the seven car spun in turn number three. As I met, as Joey Tanner, who drove the first two races at Vegas and Irwindale, he spun in turn three at Irwindale. That's what happened to Dustin Ash. He was having a really good run. Sure, he bounced back and finished seventh behind Jagger Jones. And what I might say, kudos to Jagger Jones to just not hit him. There are, and somehow it wasn't a big of a wreck. It was just basically a three car incident, mostly just two, two from two separate incidents. The one with Ash spinning didn't hit any, did barely just didn't hit the wall at all. Jones didn't ram into him. Then Bobby Hillis decided to spin. He probably got punted out of the way too. No reason for it to be oil at all. Since all of them continued. Which I must say, if you look closely at Bobby Hillis' car, it says, it, look how, look at the front bumper where it's supposed to say Camry. It's spelled K-A-M-R-E-E. -E, Camry. Yeah, he just put it in. It's like the Underbird. I I'm pretty 100% sure. I don't think he gave... I don't think he got NASCAR approval. He went with it anyway. It's the Tucson Speedway number zero car. That Honestly, I'm going to admit, seeing that zero car with that odd number one, he didn't... He also, 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 he didn't have a tarp during the coverage. If you saw the opening footage with the thunderstorms and the lightning coming along, he had no tarp in that zero car. And it's the only old car in the field when you look at the, the bodies of those Canon West cars. I honestly thought it was Kyle Nicopolis' car. <laughs> because it's, when I see that red zero and that odd looking and not so aesthetically pleasing number font, it reminded me of Kyle Nicopolis' Arca car. Because obviously the Wayne Peterson cars are notorious for the most interesting and bizarre number fonts in the world. If you haven't looked at any of those, I suggest you do. Just, he, had two, he was involved with two incidents, but again, he didn't really got in anybody's way to be frank. We'll see if we'll, we'll have to see it again. See the tape again. Of course, the NBC has and us to see what some of the entrances happened, like with Deegan in turn number one with the flat tire, and also Cody Vanderwall, and also Matt Levine as well. We got Matt Levine. Speaking of Matt Levine, he bounced back nicely. He really bounced back for a fifth place finish after having problems to bring out one of the cautions as well. But it was a shame that Dustin Hatch had that moment too, because he was he it's like all the drivers that were doing really, really, really good had problems except for Kraus and Tanner Gray. Excuse my voice crack. Those were the only two that really had flawless runs the entire time. Both races. Both two hundred laps the combined total of two hundred laps. They both had flawless races. It's just Kraus had the better car all throughout. Zamora. Zamora, I think. She deserves a she's a pat on the back. This was if this this was the breakthrough race. This was no doubt the breakthrough race for her. Led several laps. Led the first nineteen. Led twenty six total out of a hundred. Had she nailed those restart, put the foot on the pedal properly, as she mentioned in her interview at post race, she would have been right up there. I think she could have got the win and joined Haley Deegan as the only. Famous win a can and pro series race in the third overall county. Shauna Robinson's three goodies dash was from 88 89. I say she will get a win, and I'm circling it. The one obvious one I think where she's got to win, I think she could win and probably will, depending how Derek Krause does again. Evergreen Speedway with that run, I'm confident that we will see. Another female in victory lane this year. We could see if she grows and grows. I think she has the mindset of a driver that has got something to prove, but is fierce and determined. You won't see it right away, but I think she has that she means business mentality as well, much like Deegan. And I think it's really good to see female drivers that have that little mean streak in them. And I think we've yet to see that 
additional mean streak from Zamora. I think we will over time. And no doubt, by the time Evergreen rolls along, I think she'll be competing for race wins. She showed it right out of the gate. And she's a rookie, I might add. She has to deal with Jagger Jones, who is leading the rookie of the year standings. But she's fifth in points. Jones is tied with second with Huddleston. One bad race, again, one bad race could change everything. And that's the case for Deegan and I at this moment. Both of her West incidents were, to a degree, just racing deal or out of her own control. On the East is the where I'm more concerned. And especially now that she's set to make some ARCA starts. That's going to be the big test. How will she fare with the ARCA boys and girls? Of who, if there's any female drivers running in Arca, I don't, I don't think Decker's running any that I can recall in the foreseeable future. I know Tony Brininger, I don't think there's signs of her running Arca. So it's mostly the guys of Arca, like Michael Self or Christian Eckes, Brad Smiths of the world. Shout out to Brad Smith and that 48 car inside the top 10 in points. It's it, 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 good to see him run. Speaking of him, now old 48 Ford Chevy. I think it's a Ford. I think last time I remember. I don't know. Got to correct me on that one. The ARCA Championship is weird. I, I'll save that. But that's the big one. And the reason why I'm a bit skeptical of her ARCA runs more than ever is because of how she's... It's mostly I judge the runs on the East a whole lot. Because the East is where it seems like it has always been the case. Where all those talents, the superstars of the future come from. They're from the East or the Bush North. The West will get some then and there, but they just can't hit the bar, unfortunately. Sure, we uh, I think the most is in the, in the old Southwest tour with like Harbick and Greg Harbick, Biffle and Kurt Busch. Sure, you had David Gillen, but compared to Bush, Harbick, and Biffle, He's about the best, and bro, yeah, Brendan Gong too. There's just very few that come out there. Sure, we got Todd Gillen, but shout out to Todd Gillen. He got a top five for once this season in trucks. Still don't think he'll keep that Kyle Busch ride. And especially if Tanner, if they feel like Tanner Gray is transitional, transitional enough, like super ready, we may see him in trucks soon. I will not be surprised. Somebody mentioned, I think it was William Sequay. Who did the last car stuff for Canon and Arca? Don't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, either if he somehow gets a truck series ride, a couple races that are at the very end of the season. And he suggested maybe it could be one of those races that Natalie Deckers could be booted out of those one of those selected races. And we're back to the whole Deegan and Samora thing. That's that's definitely what I'm referring to because. Sure, we have Danica, and then we have Natalie Decker, who are who, who the females that made a national tour. But let's face it, the talent has not been visibly shown in the NASCAR world. Decker and Trox has been has, has, has been right on the equivalent of Tarso Marquez's Formula One career. Tarso Marquez, no, I, I'm being too harsh on Tarso Marquez off air, to be brutally honest. William Ro- Ricardo Rosset. Yeah, Ricardo Rosset. That's kind of how it's been Decker's truck series career, unfortunately. And she really needs to turn it around. She really does. Period. So with Zamora and Deegan, they're they're making they're turning their I hope they turn the mold. And they're turning the they're breaking the mold. That is the yeah, sure, the females so far has been they have no running, but they don't have the results honestly to back it up. Sure, you had Angela Rock when at Daytona top 10 and Jennifer Joe Cobb at least many, many, almost a decade ago to got a top 10 run. But there hasn't been that competitive female that backs up the competitive nature with stellar results. Danica had some then and there, but it's overshadowed with a number of crashes and vice versa that everybody knows about Danica Patrick's NASCAR career. I don't need to regurgitate. I don't have to mention it. You know the tour, whole ordeal. So that's why I... That's why I keep an eye on both of them, and I hope both of them succeed, and I hope Deegan has tremendous runs in Arca. And same thing for Samara in her rookie season. And I think she proved that she she's out to play. She, 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 she means business, no doubt. And as far as Tandra Gray is concerned, I like to see him run more west because it gets DGR Crossy 
It's a, a kind of a good test to see how they fare in the West. Kind of like what McAlilly does with Deegan and Cross a couple a couple times and throughout the year. And that's the big question that I'm going to wrap it up with. Derek Cross, I think, should go for both titles. I mentioned it in the last episode. I think with that big win and the sweep in it, Tucson, I have every reason to believe that he should go for both titles. There's no rule for it anymore where you have to pick one, known as the Noah Gregson rule, the 2015 Tucson winner. I'm out at. I say he should, and I hope McAnally considers it as an idea. They've done it with Todd Gillen before, except Todd was the best one to do so, but he lost the East title to Harrison Burton, which was shaping out to be a hell of a hell of a friendly rivalry between Burton and Gillen in that East side. But to see East regular teams, especially DGR Crossley, the defend, the championship winning team of from a year ago, do some West Virginia, and, and Tanner Gray doing really phenomenal. As is good, it's a good omen for him for the the for the reigning NHRA Pro Stock Series champion. Because remember, he won the title a year ago, so he's still the reigning champion until a new Pro Stock t- champion is crowned later in the season. So that's pretty much all it. I think Sunrise fourth. They're they're knocking at the door, but other than that, they they were non factors They were really non factors for the win at all. They were competing in the top five, but Jagger Jones and Trevor Hudson they were not really much in the picture of that voice would battle it. again. It was the I, that's why I say Gray and Cross would have had flawless races in both twin one hundreds, the Tucson Porter one hundred because they stayed out of trouble. They were the strongest two cars all race long. Well, Samora would be the third. But Samora had those restart problems that kept her out of contention, to be honest with you. So, Colorado National Speedway, June 8th. That will be round five of the k Pro Series West title chase. We're not that far from Sonoma. And now this is where business is about to pick up, where we're going to see a lot more races and a lot of things heat up. Because don't forget, we got... Colorado, we got Sonoma, we got those combo races as well. Then, of course, you have Evergreen, Meridian, and then the finale at Phoenix. So, I still think this title could have its twists and turns. So, the big question is for Colorado, can Deegan get it get it going? Because this is this has been a tough month. I mentioned it. She lost Kevin Reed Jr. She he she, she he, he didn't crew chief the South Boston races. He was not listed for the Tucson races. And I want honestly would say to say I believe that might be it for Kevin Reed Jr. until the entry list shows his name, which I don't know if it will. Then of course with Brian Deegan's health issues and other stuff, it's been a rough, rough t- couple of months. For, for the Temecula native, it really has been since her win at Vegas. Sure, she she had a really she had a third in the first race, but a fifteenth in the second, and the circumstances that it happened, which I believe that what they said the B eighteen said Trevor Huddleston. And again, as I mentioned, this is not the first time those two have had encounters. Look back at the end of the of last season, the one race where I think it was Oregon. Where Deegan got black fly for, t- for turning Huddleston. And then Deegan Huston, Huddleston battled for Rookie of the Year in the final race at Bakersfield. So, it's interesting how these things connect. It seems like Sunrise Ford <laughs> and Deegan might be the, t- the tail behind the, t- the true tale of the season. It's like there's a story within the story. Like I mentioned with Jagger Jones and Deegan. They run clean. Twice, Deegan used the bumper. From what I could understand, how Deegan got by Jones with the white flag again. It's one of those if one of those where we have to see if NBCSN will show that. And, of course, like at Irwindale, I will talk about the NBCSN portion to see if there are additional those to, or answers that need to be, questions that need to be answered. And that's one of them. The Deegan thing, how she, how she got by Jagger Jones, I want to believe is the bumper turn number one like she did in Vegas. Then it was the Matt Levine and then the Cody Vanderwall cautions. And of course, Deegan with the Huddleston in turn number one. And But other than that, the, the fan choice teller because the street was perfect. There were I saw no issues. No issues at all. I need to mention it again if I haven't already. They had no issues. No, I, the, the, there were no production problems. They didn't miss key things. They timed it perfectly on, on what battle they want to show. It was well done. 
it was really well done for the most part. I think it was the best ones thus far for that. Third time a charm for sure because it's the third race week. It was just a double header, so that's why I'm saying third time the charm instead of third and fourth time the charm because that would sound weird. But it's 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 been an interesting season thus far, and it will certainly continue. So that will do it with West Coast Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For now, until we meet again, Derek Cross. For now, it is he is the undisputed championship leader in both East and West after winning. The Tucson doubleheader for now. I'll catch you guys later.